is a very interesting piece in DejaiWorld.com entitled The Hero of African Freedom Revolutions. The piece was published the 17th of this month. It opens as follows. Congolese painfully remember 17 January, a day important for all Africans who fought against colonization and imperialism too, and a day of great sacrifice of a man who fought for freedom and independence as far as the whole world is concerned. That is the day in 1961, Patrice Emery Lumumba, the first prime minister of Democratic Republic of Congo, was murdered. This piece stands out to me since Patrice Lumumba was assassinated 62 years ago, resisting colonization and, and imperialism. And here we are today involved in the same struggle. <clears throat> For insight into this, let's turn to my next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African-American Studies at the University of Houston. He is one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of American Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back to Inside the Issues. Thank you for inviting me. The piece continues, African history is full of sordid incidents of unacceptable violence by the European imperialists. The black Africans suffered from the import of slaves from different countries to the African continent and were victims of slave trade from their own countries to other European countries, especially to the Americas. And I see, Dr. Horn, that victimization is going on today. Now at the hands of U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield as spokespeople for American uh, colonialism or neo-colonialism and imperialism. And the piece continues, though he was elected a popular prime minister, Lumumba had plenty of troubles. A major issue was his closeness to the USSR, U.S., and European countries distrusted him and named him a communist. Lumumba declared loud enough for the whole world to hear that he was not a communist. He was a democratic socialist and was opposed to capitalism and colonialism equally. And biographers of Lumumba point out that he learned on, he leaned on USSR because the European countries and U.S. did not support him. And Dr. Horn, that to me seems to be the same script, just different imperialists and colonialist actors today. Your thoughts, sir? Well, first of all, your audience should be familiar with the film by the celebrated Haitian filmmaker Raoul Peck, his film La Mumba, mm -hmm. which goes into some detail, albeit in a docudrama concerning his life and assassination. We all recall that it was in the late 19th century that King Leopold of Belgium claimed this sprawling country bigger than uh, Western Europe uh, as his own personal fiefdom and then imposed a draconian regime of labor exploitation featuring the cutting off of limbs and hands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if workers were not sufficiently deemed to be energetic in laboring for next to nothing. Patrice Lumumba arose approximately 63 years ago as the symbol of Congolese freedom. He was supported by Kwame Nkrumah, whose Ghana had come to independence in 1957. But alas, uh, the so-called red jacket was placed on Patrice Lumumba, that is to say, he was deemed to be a communist and therefore beyond the pale. And as a result, he was subjected to assassination. Uh, indeed, the assassination was so audacious that Larry Devlin, not Devil, uh, who was the CIA station chief in the Congo, actually wrote an entire book about <laughs> this crime against the Congolese people, if not a crime under U.S. law. And so it is well that we return to this struggle. And I think it's a particularly important, not only for people of African descent, 
in the United States, a disproportionate number of whom, whether they know it or not, or of Congolese ancestry, since the Congo was a major victim of the unlamented African slave trade. But this is relevant to raise because you mentioned Secretary of State Blinken, for example, and we should also mention a Governor DeSantis of Florida, whose mm. state has just decreed that advanced placement African American history cannot be taught in K mm -hmm. through 12 schools, which is simply outrageous. And certainly it helps to hamper our ability to comprehend how we reach this point. There's a lot. Well, you mentioned uh, his assassination. Uh, people need to understand he was uh, he was murdered. Then I believe buried. Then uh, they dug they dug up his remains. They dismembered his remains. Poured acid over his remains, buried him again, and then I think they dug him up again ground up his bones and spread his the those remains over a, a unknown area and all that was left was a gold tooth which was recently returned to his son that in my opinion demonstrates just how heinous and ungodly these colonists were and make no mistake continue to be dr horn well i think it also bespeaks the fury of the colonizers and people of african ancestry in north america should not be unaware of this phenomenon because if you look at the similarly horrific history of lynching in this country, mm -hmm. post-1865, for the most part, phenomenon where Black people would be executed without due process of law, uh, with a carnival-like atmosphere prevailing, as Euro-Americans across class lines would gather, oftentimes participating in the dismembering of the victim, probably on kitchen shelves to this very day. There are digits of Black lynching victims uh, still remaining. Certainly there were postcards uh, uh, that were then sold to those who came to these uh, bestial carnivals. And so what this bespeaks is a kind of fury and anger at the victims, which is comprehensible in the sense that uh, these victims oftentimes were the source of untold wealth. And when they began to rebel, when our ancestors and the Congolese, for that matter, began to rebel, uh, this was seen as jeopardizing the major and minor fortunes of the exploiters, which then caused them to explode, leading not only to lynchings, but at last to the execution dismemberment, and obviously obscene killing of Mr. Lumumba. And the way that you just described that feeling towards uh, the victim, that just brought to mind James Baldwin's I'm Not Your Nigger. And I'm not going to get into that poem right now, but folks, if you get a chance, look that one up. That's some, uh, um, you can find it on YouTube. And that is some very, very powerful uh, Baldwin. I strongly suggest folks you you check that out. Uh, I, I bring Lumumba up now, A, because uh, the 17th uh, was the commemoration uh, of his murder, but there's a lot at play on the continent right now. The U.S. with AFRICOM and U.S. trained officers have led seven coups and coup attempts in African countries over the last almost two years three times in uh, Burkina Faso, three times in Mali, uh, one time each in Guinea, Mauritania, and Gambia. And this while, again, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield says at the UN, peace cannot wait in Africa. It must come from African leaders, African institutions for Africa's people. 
sounds like Gaddafi, let us work together under the leadership of African countries to forge a more peaceful, more prosperous, more secure future. Well, I have to ask uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, how do you do that when you are overthrowing governments of countries in the continent of Africa? The hypocrisy spoken by Blinken, the hypocrisy spoken by Linda Thomas Greenfield is nauseating. Well, this also reminds us that as we speak, there is a diplomatic controversy between South Africa and the United States. South Africa, as you know, is a member of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, an alignment of nations that's challenging the hegemony of the United States and its North Atlantic allies plus Japan. Uh, as we speak, South Africa is apparently involved in military maneuvers off the southern tip of Africa uh, with Russia. That has not gone down very well uh, in Washington. And we should realize that even though post-1994, post the election of Mandela, South Africa has tried to play ball, obviously, mm -hmm. with Washington. Its economy is open, obviously, to U.S. investment. Uh, perhaps that's one of the problems with the economy. But I think that the United States has this tendency to not necessarily seek out partners and allies, but particularly in Africa, but to seek out vassals and mm -hmm. puppets. And apparently South Africa is not equipped to play that role, hence this controversy. Uh, which should no, be no, no shock to those of you in the audience who follow Southern African affairs, because you probably are also aware of the fact that relations between South Africa's neighbor, speaking of Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, those relations are hardly ideal. Since about two decades ago, the post-colonial government sought to redistribute the land from the European invaders, to the Africans, the United States perhaps sensed that as a threat to its own settler colonialism and therefore rounded up a posse to impose sanctions on Zimbabwe, seeking to drive the economy into to the ditch. In fact, there was serious discussion about an invasion of Zimbabwe to engage in regime change. The fact that South Africa was unwilling to engage in, in this kind of banditry also uh, led to a downturn in relations between uh, Washington and Pretoria. And this has been the uh, sorry course of relations between this continent and its longtime exploiter, speaking of the United States of America. I want to get back to the uh, South Africa hosting this joint naval exercise on the other side, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Wilmer Leon here and inside the issues is where you are. Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Dr. Gerald Horn is my guest. And what I wanted to do in this uh, hour with Dr. Horn is connect a number of dots uh, between what's going on with countries on the continent of Africa, with uh, with Russia, with China, with the United States, and hopefully provide some clarity so that you all can see that uh, many leaders uh, of these countries uh, in, in, in Africa, they're, they're operating in their best interest. They are sovereign entities and they're doing what they perceive to be in their best interest in spite of the pressure that the United States is trying to employ. And Dr. Horn, thank you so much as always for staying with me. And when we were going into the break, you were talking about some Zimbabwean history. And I, I wanna quickly just uh, uh, expound a little bit on that, uh, so so the people need to understand that Zimbabwe, well, Rhodesia, uh, as a as part of their peace agreement uh, between Zimbabwe and London, they entered into the Lancaster House Agreement. And uh, I'm now I'm drawing a blank on the president of Zimbabwe at the time, uh, Mugabe. Robert Mugabe came out of the bush fought, in fact, as an ally of Nelson Mandela and came out of the bush, uh, reached a peace agreement, and the United States co-signed that agreement. I think it was the Carter administration 
with land reclamation. Britain agreed to pay white Zimbabweans for their land uh, as President Mugabe wanted to return that land to black Zimbabweans. Britain agreed. United States agreed to back it up. Ronald Reagan comes into power, says we ain't doing it. And so once again, the United States reneged on their agreement with a foreign country and hence imposed sanctions on, on, uh, on Mugabe as uh, he, he decided to follow through with the agreement and told the farmers, you want your money, call London because they're the ones that promised to give it to you. And the rest, as we say, is history. Um, I wanted to tie that history with the current reality, South Africa to host second joint naval military exercise with Russia and China near its coast, set to take place in February. This joint trilateral naval, ex naval exercise marks the second military drill to take place between the South African Navy, the Russian Navy, and the Chinese People's Liberation Army uh, since November of 2019. And this, of course, has put the United States in an uproar. Uh, but the United States ire isn't really based upon what the United States considers to be the best interest of the African countries. It's what the United States deems to be in the best interest of its access to resources for pennies on the dollar that are extracted from these countries. Is that is that fair to say, sir? And it's also a reflection of the fact that, like many across planet Earth, South Africa recognizes that the BRICS, particularly China, is in the passing lane. We know, for example, that as is tradition, the newly appointed Chinese foreign minister, Chen Gong, is touring Africa. That's a tradition. The first trip for a Chinese foreign minister is to tour Africa. Just a few days ago, uh, he unveiled a sparkling brand new headquarters in Addis Ababa of the African Center for Disease Control. Bad news for Ebola and for COVID-19, uh, good news for African health and well-being. And I think that as a result of this changing correlation of forces, it has helped to inspire nations like South Africa to more aggressively pursue their national interests at the same time, it is petrifying. The United States in particular, which not only faces the prospect of being left being left sprawling in the dust by China, but also being the nation that rings down the curtain on a centuries-long escapade known as global white supremacy, that is to say, with China as the number one country, it will be difficult to speak of white supremacy in the old way, no matter if its victims or as its beneficiaries would like to think otherwise. You know, we have been conditioned in this country, particularly over the last, I'll say, probably five years. I'll just use that as a, as a random number. China is our enemy. Russia, now that the anti-Russian thing goes back much further. Russia is our enemy. And the United States government is trying to uh, impose uh, that rhetoric on African leaders. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation today and particularly have it with you is because you are very able to unpack a lot of that rhetoric and demonstrate that the leaders in these countries, they're doing business. They're interested in fertilizer. They're interested in debt relief. They're interested in, uh, in, in doing business uh, in a business-like manner instead of overseer vassal relationships. So if you could unpack, if you could, a little bit of this anti- uh, China rhetoric, a little bit of this anti-Russia rhetoric, because these the leaders of these countries, they're trying to do business. Well, it was a very striking interview in the last few days 
in the European publication Le Figaro with the leading French intellectual Emmanuel Todd, who suggested that we may be in the early stages of what he called World War III, with Russia and China on one side of the barricades and the United States and its North Atlantic allies on the other, uh, he suggests that uh, unlike uh, previous world wars, the United States might not exit this world war uh, totally intact. Now, now, I know that there are those in your audience who recall that the United States has survived foreign policy fiascos in Vietnam, in Iraq, and Afghanistan, amongst others. The difference with this current unfolding fiasco is that it is confronting two well-armed nuclear states with China being the number two economy uh, with the bullet, pardon the expression. And I think that if I am able to see that and able to perceive what Emmanuel Todd is suggesting, the same holds true for uh, nations that have embassies in Washington and in Brussels and in Paris. Uh, speaking of which, I should also point you to a recent article about a former top military advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel, the former leader of the Federal Republic of Germany. I'm speaking of General Eric Bod, who suggests that the better part of wisdom would be for Germany, uh, perhaps encouraging the United States to withdraw from Ukraine sooner rather than later, rather mm -hmm. than face the prospect of a catastrophe. Now, that kind of sage advice is not necessarily uh, being observed in Washington. The latest news is that on the Ramstein base in Germany, uh, controlled by Washington, uh, there is a meeting unfolding of defense ministers. Interestingly enough, the German defense minister up until a few days ago was Christine Lambrecht. Uh, she was forced out of office. Uh, I would say through no fault of her own, she was basically a dealt a losing hand that she tried to play and therefore has to walk the plank as a result mm -hmm. of uh, the war not going very well. But the problem on this side of the Atlantic is that even though the Ukrainians are suffering on the battlefield, if you look at the military industrial complex, uh, speaking of Raytheon and Lockheed in the first instance, the tax dollars and the billions that are going to Ukraine are making a U-turn and returning into the pockets of corporate executives of these merchants of death who then are able to buy yet another McMansion in Falls Church, Virginia, or Chevy Chase, Maryland. Uh, this is the story, I'm afraid to say, of what's going on in Ukraine. And it's just one more reason why nations like South Africa are perceiving and feeling that Washington is an unreliable partner, an unreliable ally, that in any case is seemingly headed for catastrophe. Uh, you've you've taken this to Ukraine, and and I w I want to make this point for my audience to to ask themselves because so many of us want to follow this ridiculous rhetoric, and uh, we have to support Ukraine. We have to support Ukraine. We have to support the people of Ukraine. Well, that to me begs the question, okay, if that's what you want to do, fine. But which Ukrainians are you supporting? And when I ask that question, I usually get the blank stare, the blink, 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 and the stare, what are you talking about? Well, are you supporting the Ukrainians that were being in the West, that were being bombed by the Ukrainians in the East, in the from the, the those in the Donbass region, that were being ethnically cleansed in since 2014? Are, are you backing those Ukrainians? Who are you trying to defend, and why? Or do you even realize that this whole? thing was taking place as the United States went in uh, 
it, you know, people say they want to defend democracy in Ukraine, but if so, fine. But why did the United States, under with the direction of Victoria Nuland, go in in 2014 and overthrow the democratically elected government in Ukraine? So it, am I right to ask those questions, Dr. Horn? Well, as our friends in Cuba oftentimes say, there are no indiscreet questions, only <laughs> indiscreet answers. And there is no such thing as an indiscreet question when it comes to Ukraine, given the fact that our tax dollars and perfusion are being poured down that rat hole as homelessness stalks the Black community in particular from New York to Los Angeles. And the unhoused population in Los Angeles uh, in the next few days, believe it or not, may have to endure uh, below freezing weather. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they moved to that Southern California metropolis in the first place, because they thought it was a land of sunshine and beaches. But with the uh, prospect of climate alteration unfolding, uh, even that reliability is no longer assured. Dr. Joe Horn is my guest. We're, I'm trying to draw, trying to connect some dots in terms of what's happening with a number of countries on the continent of Africa, the U.S. rhetoric from people like uh, Secretary of State Blinken and U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the rhetoric doesn't match the action. And uh, these leaders are not inept. These leaders are not naive. These leaders are not stupid. Uh, they're sovereign, uh, sovereign leaders operating in what they perceive to be in the best interest of their countries. Um, and to that point, Dr. Horn, the Times of London has a piece entitled Debt Write-Off Shows China Means Business in Africa. While the West talks of democracy and human rights, Beijing seeks in dollars to tighten its influence on the continent. The latest move being a stake in Ethiopia. Uh, you were talking about the uh, the uh, foreign minister, um, uh, Quinn Gang. He's in, he's in Ethiopia, and he announced China's latest overture, the cancellation of Ethiopia's debt, which runs $13.7 billion. These are the types of business transactions that are going on between China and countries like Ethiopia. All the United States has to offer is the Countering Malign Russian Influence Act, where the United States, under the leadership of Hakeem Jeffries, wants to uh, chastise, sanction, and punish African countries that decide to do business in their best interest. Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, it's interesting to compare the figures from that article you cite with the reported figure coming out of the so-called summit between four dozen plus uh, African heads of state and government and Mr. Biden taking place in Washington, D.C. in December 2022. Now, the reported figure for almost or 50 plus countries, actually, is $55 billion. And here you have one simple debt write-off to <laughs> one sovereign African nation amounting to $13 billion. Some decades ago, the then U.S. President George H.W. Bush suggested that his country had more will than wallet. That is to say, it's nothing new for the United States to make empty promises. And yet, at the same time, we see that AFRICOM, the militarized Africa command headquartered at the Pentagon, actually uh, headquartered in Africa, technically, and designed to repress signs of sovereignty that do not please Washington, its budget does not seem to be uh, to have a ceiling. In fact, we know that uh, as we speak, there are negotiations about raising the debt ceiling in Washington, D.C., with regard to this $31 trillion debt that the United States has, uh, 
And yet we're told that the almost $1 trillion budget of the Pentagon is sacrosanct, that it cannot be touched. And yet on the chopping block, apparently, are such items as Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, the wounding of the far former, speaking of Social Security, uh, could be devastating for our seniors, uh, leaving all too many of them to try to survive on a diet of dog food, if you like. So this is the absurdity to which this self-proclaimed sole remaining superpower has descended as it confronts the specter of being left sprawling in the dust by a rising China. I mentioned Hakeem Jeffries on the Countering Malign Russian uh, Activities Act is actually Gregory Meeks. And what's the difference? Uh, you know, they're easy to confuse since neither one of them is really about anything. Uh, to your point about Medicare and Social Security, we're talking about austerity measures. And there's a piece, particularly as we're looking at what's going on in Davos, Switzerland, more austerity means more protests in 2023. World leaders have begun meeting in Davos to discuss cooperation to address multiple crises from COVID-19 and escalating inflation. There is a very simple economic fact, Dr. Horn, I believe you can't cut your way to growth. You can't austere your way to profitability. I mean, you can, I'm sorry, austere your way to profitability, which serves the interests of the elite, but you can't cut your way to growth in a so-called attempt to help the poor, working, and middle class. Uh, this is really just a, a shell game. All these austerity measures, they're not talking about doing away with tax cuts for the wealthy that Donald Trump in, in put in place. They're talking about doing, and these are Democrats talking about doing this, what I believe Joe Biden's been wanting to do all along. Medicare, Social Security, privatize cut. Your thoughts, sir? Well, it, it's, it's quite devastating what's being discussed right now. And I should also mention <laughs> that uh, at Davos in Switzerland, where routinely in January, the elite come to meet. On the sidelines is a meeting between Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen and her Chinese counterpart. Now, we know that the People's Bank of China is one of the debt holders, perhaps up to a trillion dollars, which makes it rather ironic that China is in the crosshairs, that if there is any bipartisanship in Washington, it unites the Democrats and Republicans on an anti-Beijing agenda. But again, as we speak, Secretary of Yellen, figuratively at least, is on bended knee uh, in Davos, uh, trying to wheedle the Chinese into either A, continuing to buy U.S. Treasury bills so that the United States government can continue functioning, so the United States government can continue pressuring China, what a paradox that is, or B, uh, not to dump a number of Treasury bills uh, in that debt of one trillion, which could be devastating uh, for the U.S. Treasury, devastating for the U.S. economy, uh, this is the irony and the paradox in which we are now enmeshed. And switching gears just a little bit, but just to show another example, uh, I think uh, just uh, Thursday, the United, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Russia has agreed to do to trade uh, with Egypt in Egyptian currency, basically offering uh, salvation to the fledgling Egyptian economy. Well, that's the wave of the future. Heretofore, if a nation like Ghana wanted to buy petroleum, it would have to round up U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. And unlike Washington, Ghana cannot print U.S. dollars. That obviously put a nation like Ghana in a bind. But now, with the rise of China, we are on the cusp of an impending demotion uh, 
of the U.S. dollar recalled that perhaps prematurely, Saddam Hussein, with regard to his oil, and Muammar Gaddafi, with regard to his oil, were seeking to demote the U.S. dollar as well, and mm -hmm. you know what happened to them. But recently, you know that the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to meet with the Saudi leadership about, uh, among other things, uh, trading Saudi oil for a Chinese currency. You see Ghana, once known as the Gold Coast, trying to trade gold for precious imports and commodities. Again, this is a demotion of the U.S. dollar, and it also bespeaks the decline in influence and potency of U.S. imperialism, which it was thought was bestriding the world like a latter-day colossus. And to just put a final point in that, so folks can really understand the significance of this Russia-Egypt deal, in order for Russia to trade with Egypt in Egypt in the pound, which I think is what their currency is, that means that Russia has to have Egyptian pounds on hand. So by acquiring Egyptian pounds, that stabilizes the currency, which goes a very long way in stabilizing the economy. And I think that also demonstrates the strengthening of the relationship. And that, I believe, will go a very long way in helping Egypt strengthen its position within the region outside of the sphere of U.S. slash Israeli influence. Well, certainly, and speaking of Israeli influence, there is justifiable alarm in the Israeli lobby, at least certain sectors of the Israeli lobby in the United States, about this right-wing, in fact, neo-fascist turn that's taking place uh, in Israel. Uh, you might have seen the column by Tom Friedman of the New York Times uh, to that effect. Mm -hmm. And it, it's also rather alarming because we know that this not only means ill for the Palestinian population, but possibly it could lead to another conflict between Israel and its neighbors, uh, amongst which are Egypt, for example. We know that Israel has been involved in stirring the pot of unrest in Syria for so many years now. But Syria is seemingly stabilizing, which means that it's probably due for another dose of Israeli administered unrest. Once again, our tax dollars are helping to subsidize this kind of banditry by the Israeli authorities, which obviously is in contradiction to the needs of the U.S. population uh, who are indeed suffering all manner of deficits, including with regard to the all-important issue of housing. And to that point about Israel and the Israeli lobby, uh, there, is a, uh, there was a Just News, and I think in a New York Times piece, anti-Semitism worst among blacks and young adults in poll released ahead of MLK Day. Uh, I, I've been seeing as I scroll through uh, a number of channels through my cable provider, there's some uh, Jewish uh, religious channels. And I've noticed over the last probably two months or so that there's this increased dialogue about uh, African-American and Jewish relationships mm. on these channels. And they're talking to younger African-Americans, many of whom are Jewish. Mm. And there's all this banter and discussion about What's been happening to the relationship between the Jewish community and the African-American community? And then I see this article, this so-called uh, poll, anti-Semitism worst among blacks and young, young adults. This was really nothing more than propaganda. They didn't define anti-Semitism. Uh, am, am, I, am I seeing this right? And if so, if you could talk about why now all of this interest and concern about the relationship between the African-American community and the, what I, I'll really say is the Zionist community, not the Jewish community. 
Well, what, what's striking is the definition, because increasingly in the United States, if you oppose Israeli depredations in historic Palestine or opposed to any aspect of the Zionist agenda, by the measure of some, that makes you ipso facto a bigot and an anti-Semite, which means, of course, that the Black community, which historically has tried to stand alongside the oppressed worldwide, recall that the beginning of the so-called Black Jewish Rift arose in 1956 when Israel, in conjunction with British and French colonialism, attacked the Egypt of Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm -hmm. who wanted control of the Suez Canal on his territory. And that led to mass Black American sympathy for Egypt, which the rising nation of Islam was able to take advantage of. This was taking place in the context of an ideological vacuum created by the bludgeoning of left and progressive formations, including unions, which opened the door for all manner of regressive tendencies, I'm afraid to say. And I'm also afraid to say that many of those who are bleating and braying about alleged and purported Black anti-Semitism were also involved in bludgeoning the left, which created this ideological vacuum just referenced. So once again, we see that there are all manner of contradictions that are ensnarling uh, so many in this country, and I'm not sure if they are really aware of what's going on. There, one of the questions or one of the statements here, three out of 10 blacks agreed that, quote, Jews still talk too much about what happened to them in the Holocaust, end quote. If someone takes issue with that, does that ipso facto make them anti-Semitic or does that just make them tired of hearing about the conversation? I mean, well, <laughs> it, it would be silly and ridiculous if it wasn't serious. Well, see, there's there's a contradiction uh, in 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 that that particular discourse. What I mean is, is that you have many Jewish people who have dual, perhaps contradictory obligations. On the one hand, they perceive themselves to be part of the so-called white majority, and that particular majority, uh, at least in the United States, has not been particularly uh, progressive and in fact has been a stalwart opponent of, for example, anti-racist measures like affirmative action. At the same time, the Jewish community is part of a substantial religious minority, and that particular religious minority has suffered grievously in a nation which the late historian uh, Ray Allen Billington said in a book that came out years ago, was the spearhead of a so-called Protestant crusade. In fact, the Catholic minority also suffered grievously as a result. And so you have this contradiction where some in the Jewish community are trying to ride two different horses going in different directions at the same time. Uh, one horse leads towards the mandate of a so-called white majority, which in its majority has not necessarily been in the vanguard of progressivism. And the other horse is with regard to minority rights and minority interests of which the Jewish community should be quite concerned, but the former obligation oftentimes vitiates the latter obligation. And to that point about the uh, th agreeing that Jews still talk too much about what happened to them in the Holocaust, I remember having... Uh, Norman Finkelstein on the show, and he, he was at the time he had just written his book, uh, The Holocaust Industry, and he talked about his growing up in New York and in the Jewish community that he grew up in. They didn't talk about the Holocaust. They were trying to move on. They were trying to uh, adapt and uh, into American society and culture. And he said his parents and his grandparents they wanted to leave all of that discussion 
in the past. So I bring that up to say, if there were many Jews in a, in the United States that felt that way then, why would it be anti-Semitic for, uh, for African Americans to feel that way now, if in fact it is true? And here's another uh, uh, statement that they put in this piece. Jews think they are better. 31% of black Americans agreed I'm sorry, 29% of black Americans agree Jews think they're better than other people. If one believes that, A, does that make them anti-Semitic? B, don't many Jews consider themselves to be the chosen people of God? Well, if you consider yourself to be the chosen people of God, I would tend to think you have a, a thought you're better than other people. <laughs> Am I wrong, Dr. Horn? Well, th this is the problem when we get involved in these religious discourses, because we know that there have been many conflicts and wars on planet Earth in previous centuries. Mm -hmm. There have been class wars. There has been a kind of gender conflict. But perhaps the bloodiest and most conflict of wars have been religious wars. And I think that if you look at the origins of the United States of America, in fact, if you look at settler colonialism in North America emerging in the 16th century, it emerges in the context of religious wars. This one between mostly Protestant England and heavily Catholic Spain. The United States still bears the earmarks of that religious sectarianism which is having a kind of efflorescence as we speak. We see that the U.S. Supreme Court, in trying to reduce, if not eviscerate, uh, LBGTQ rights, oftentimes uses a Christian rationale. That is to say, a Christian shopkeeper is not obligated to serve a gay couple that wants a wedding cake, uh, for example. That's mm -hmm. the opinion of many conservative justices. And so... This is complicating, I'm afraid to say, an already complex ethnic and religious scenario in the United States of America. And the kind of poll that you're now referencing is doing little to resolve or add clarity to the complexity. And it's not intended to in any way, in any way, shape or form. Uh, folks, let me say, you've got to do some reading. You can't take these, uh, reports and stories on face value. You've got to be more discerning when you listen or watch CNN and, uh, MSNBC, CIA, you've got to pay a lot more attention. You've got to question if the, if it doesn't make sense, then, then on, on, on his face, do some reading. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis. And uh, I look forward to having you back. Thank you. Folks, Dr.